What makes a story perfect? This question is incredibly interesting, especially considering that absolute perfection doesn't really exist. You will always be able to find flaws and issues to nitpick in literally anything. I think that the answer to this question therefore becomes pretty personal and will vary from person to person. For me, a story is perfect when it sets out both thematic and narrative goals and achieves those goals both elegantly, passionately and convincingly. While I obviously look out for things like depth, consistency, meaning, etc, the core of what I really want out of a story is for it to have a purpose and fulfill that purpose as well as it can. And when a story does that with such skill, passion and confidence that I am willing to overlook the minor issues every story will naturally have, that's when it becomes perfect for me. Today I would like to discuss one such story. If you've spent any significant amount of time on my channel, then you know that I have a lot of appreciation for George's Bizarre Adventure's fifth part, Vento Aureo, or Golden Wind. And part 5 is, indeed, a work of fiction I consider perfect by my standards. Now, because I love talking about it, and because I know some of you disagree with me on this, I think it's time that we explore in depth what makes Golden Wind as good as it is. Buckle up, this will be a longer video, I will provide timestamps in the description for the various sections. With that out of the way, sit down, lay back, grab a snack, and listen, as I tell you about the brilliance of Golden Wind. Jojo is quite infamous for its uniquely western appeal. Series author Hiroyuko Araki is widely known to be very familiar with western pop culture such as music and cinema, and this shines through in some more obvious ways, for example the stand names. However, one thing that sometimes doesn't get mentioned is just how fond Araki seems to be of the west in general, specifically Italy. So much so that he has taken many trips to the boot-shaped country, and even went as far as to include personal holiday pictures from those trips in the art book Jojo A Gogo from back in 2000. And it's these pictures and these experiences that he referenced when creating the authentic setting of Part 5. As the ancient center of the Roman Empire and the current center of the Catholic Church, Italy is a country filled to the brim with European culture and history. No matter where you are in the country, you are never that far away from some historic site or some remnants of relevant human footprints. And while the gang does indeed never go visit any museums, Araki does pour a lot of his fascination and fondness for the country's history and culture into the setting of part 5. From something as monumental as the Colosseum to a tiny detail like the taxistas scamming tourists, the story is filled with these little love letters to Italy and the Italian way of life. And while they seem minor and insignificant at first, they do build up over time and end up lending an incredible level of authenticity and identity to Vento Aureo's depiction of Italy. Thanks to how real, solid and alive Italy feels, the gang's journey has a real monumental feel to it, like every part of their journey touches a real location. This is further strengthened when you consider that even the areas Araki doesn't name specifically exist in real life and even look very similar to their fictional counterparts. Additionally, Depicting the culture of Italy in such a subtle, yet present way helps contextualize some of the thematic ideas of the part. Italy is a bastion of human culture, a melting pot of humanity's various eras, ideas and struggles. And it's this culturally rich foundation that Araki uses as a base to continue building a story that touches on inherently human and introspective ideas. And Jojo loves its ideas and themes. Just like in the other parts, this story and its various elements are tied to the themes and ideas incredibly strongly, though even more so here than in other Jojo parts. Luckily, the part also isn't very subtle with its main theme, at least on surface level. Giorno's speech during the White Album fight essentially spells it out. This story is about resolve, the will to change something because you believe your ambitions and dreams to be just. If we combine this with the overall theme of all of Jojo, being humanity's inherent relation with fate, we see that Vento Aureo is essentially a story about the resolve to oppose fate. At its heart, Golden Wind is a story of a group of brave people coming together and fighting on against the odds of fate for a goal greater than themselves. 
And while that can be said about other Jojo parts as well, in this story, the idea at the foreground is to overcome whatever holds you back and steal your resolve to achieve a dream you know is righteous and born out of truth. This central principle penetrates every single aspect of Vento Aureo's story. While there are many characters and moving pieces to this story, there are two central pillars that hold it together. Giorno and Diavolo, and their relationship with fate and resolve. While we already discussed Diavolo as a character and psychological study in previous videos, I would like to discuss him from a functional aspect within the plot and themes. As the main villain of the story, he presents the main obstacle for the gang to overcome, However, he works a bit differently from your average big bad. Quite often in fiction, villains will be incredibly proactive, usually being the catalyzing force for the story to happen. For example, both Dio Brando and Funny Valentine act according to their ambitions to change something about the environment they find themselves in, and thus force the respective protagonists to react to that. Diavolo, however, is the exact opposite. He doesn't want to change or achieve anything because he already has most of what he wants. Similarly to Kira, he is already in the position he desires and all he really wants is to maintain that position. And while that does make him a lot more passive and reactionary than other villains in the series, especially in the first half, it works wonders in making him feel like a true obstacle. He is the status quo, he is fate, he is reality. He doesn't need to be proactive because the world around him has already bent to his will, fate has already made him the victor, according to him. He isn't an evil force trying to derail society, he is an evil force that has already forced society under his heel. And that is clearly an intended idea, as Araki spends a lot of time just establishing how dangerous, powerful and nigh on invincible Diavolo is. And while yes, he does approach most main villains like this, there is a lot more emphasis on the terror that Diavolo inspires specifically. For example, out of all the villains, he is the one we know and see the least of, his real appearance only being present in a handful of chapters. Additionally, his backstory is kept purposefully confusing and contradictory. All in all, this is all in service of making him less of a character and more of a malicious, power-hungry force of nature. He doesn't really have a past, he basically has no defined form, he simply exists and twists the reality around him to obey his commands. In terms of the story, one could see him as a stand-in for the deterministic, unchangeable nature of fate and its inevitability, a destiny of stone against which all resistance is nigh on futile. Which is ironic, considering that Diavolo only has this position thanks to his ability to quote-unquote change fate. He constantly strives to better himself and, as he puts it, defeat the weaker past versions of himself. Additionally, armed with his stand King Crimson, his ability to foresee fate and then twist it according to his desires is a perverted and half-assed version of the main theme, the resolve to change fate. What's interesting here is that he doesn't technically change it per se. As Diablo says a few times, the visions epitaph produces are absolute and unchangeable. And that holds somewhat true. Even with King Crimson, he never actually changes what he sees in the vision, at least not completely. He merely erases the time that troubles him and positions himself such that he will still come out on top. And while that is effective, he essentially skips past all of the hard work and resolve that would usually be necessary to change one's fate. And as the single most important scene in this part tells us, if you only desire the result without putting in the work, you will never reach the truth. You lose sight of what matters if you only ever concern yourself with the results of your actions and not your actions themselves. And even though Diavolo never met Abakio's partner, I am sure that after his final humiliation, he would have agreed with him. Whereas our villain represents a twisted, perverted take on the part's main theme, our protagonist embodies its purest form. Giorno Giovanna, while often being described as bland or boring, actually does a lot for this story. Out of any of the Jojo protagonists, Giorno is perhaps the most proactive protagonist the series has seen thus far, 
only being rivaled by Part 7's Johnny Joestar. He has a very clear and motivated goal in mind and pursues it from the very beginning of the story of his own accord. Rise to the top of the mob and fix the problems of Italy, specifically the drug trade. He wants to save and inspire the same way he was saved and inspired himself. Yet his resolve and dream are not naive. He understands that, with the way the world is at the time, the official and lawful organs of his country will never be able to provide on that level, at least not without massive changes. And so he sets out to achieve his dream in the illegal, but not much easier way. Infiltrating and taking over La Passione, the enormous and unrivaled mafia network that rules over Italy. This setup reveals and later develops something incredibly central. Giorno embodies absolute resolve. His goals are clear to him and he's willing to basically do anything to achieve them. But because he is equal parts Jonathan and Dio, he doesn't shy away from having to use amoral and illegal ways to do it. In fact, that simply doesn't matter. He knows his goal is, ultimately, just and righteous, so much so that the way of achieving it only has to consist of hard work and effort, regardless of its morality or legality. This belief and idea is the central nucleus of who Giorno Giovanna is and it determines his position in the story. Giorno essentially becomes a guiding light for the other characters, a beacon of resolve that inspires and motivates those around him to follow suit and believe in their actions and mission wholeheartedly. While many characters in the story often have their own motivations and ideals, it's Giorno that catalyzes them into action. And here we see an interesting inversion of the usual formula. In many stories, the antagonist will be a force outside of the norm and will act in an attempt to bend their environment and situation towards a new status that they deem favorable. The protagonistic force will then react to that and defend order slash justice slash freedom or whatever. However, here it's the other way around. The antagonistic force, Diavolo, is the norm and resides in a situation that he doesn't need to change. Meanwhile, our protagonist Giorno acts in order to upheave the status quo, which then forces Diavolo to react. And obviously, just doing things differently doesn't inherently make it better, but I do think that this inversion creates an interesting situation in combination with the oppressive, unnerving aspects of Diavolo we already mentioned. The events of Golden Wind all center around its fundamental thematic ideas, so I think it's appropriate to go through them step by step and see how these themes evolve and apply. Giorno begins his journey as a small-time crook with big wishes that he's resolute to fulfill. This starting point is very important because he begins the story already being the embodiment of resolve. He is, by all means and purposes, a pretty static character, but that is kind of the point. He is meant to be this steady, shining light that grounds and inspires his allies and, in some cases, even his enemies. His battle with Pucciarati and its resolution are a good example of that. Pucciarati had, prior to this fight, already lost faith and trust in the organization as he had found out that they were selling drugs as well. Giorno, being incredibly good at reading people after years of abuse, calls him out on his good nature and doubt of the mob immediately after incapacitating him saying that their fight is over since Bucciarati is a good person. While it isn't treated as a huge moment at the time, we find out way later that it was an incredibly impactful thing for Bucciarati. Having both the fundamentals of his person and the dissonance between those fundamentals and his alignment with Passione laid bare to him by an enemy that even refuses to fight him past that, woke him up and inspired him to live by his own ideals again, thus solidifying his and Giorno's plan to overthrow the boss. The boss also makes his first appearance here, at least symbolically. The heroin veins on the boy's arm are the first indication of his presence in the series, less a character and more a cancer on society that feeds on the misery of those who succumb to despair and anguish. And so, Giorno uses that indication combined with his understanding of people's motivation and his shining aura of resolve to free Bucciarati of his doubt and make him realize what it is he wants, what he really wants and needs. To oppose the fate they seem trapped in and conquer Passione in the name of a better future. Giorno's trial by Polpo is less about Giorno's resolve in of itself and more about Giorno as a character. 
While we still do get glimpses of his resolute nature and his craftiness when it comes to achieving his goals, what is important to note here is how it fleshes him out as a character. Giorno is defined by a duality between brilliant righteousness and devious malice and cruelty. He is, in a very literal sense, half Jonathan and half Dio. While many use his fight with Chocolata as the more prominent example, and don't worry, we'll get to that, the Black Sabbath arc is also quite important to this. While his goal itself is noble, he immediately contradicts that by not only showing his skills in pickpocketing, but also lying about not having a stand, continuously calculating what to do and say to put himself into the most advantageous position possible. These traits are all very reminiscent of Dio. However, after Black Sabbath kills an innocent old man, we see Jonathan shine through. He sees this as an unforgivable offense and an act of pure evil that must be avenged. Yet, the method he chooses to avenge it ends up being way more Dio-esque. Additionally, this little arc lets us see Giorno through the eyes of Koichi, to have him confirm that this is indeed a real Jojo, and that Giorno shines with the same larger-than-life quality that his predecessors had. However, again, Diavolo is present here. While Liki Ai Luca and Bucciarati seem more like small-time crooks like Giorno, Polpo is the first character that really starts showing how organized Passione actually is. Between the capos, the various cells and territories, this is our first indication of just how much of a task Giorno and Bruno have embarked on. Once Giorno gets introduced to the rest of the gang, we get the first bit of pushback. Giorno isn't able to immediately connect with the gang and hits a bit of a speed bump. His reckless action during the soft machine fight does help them out, but it overall just reminds Abaki of his trauma and infuriates him. Also, he doesn't quite manage to be of any real help to Mista during his fight with Kraftwerk, even though Mista is probably the member he gets along with the best. This section is more used to contrast the organization we saw from Polpo earlier. While our first glimpse of Passione implied a uniform, homogenous force, this arc shows a different picture. Infighting, rivalries, betrayals, and all that, even to the point of stand battles. Hell, the entire goal of this story arc is for the gang to get to Popo's fortune, which would technically belong to the Mafia, steal it, then give it back to the Mafia in exchange for elevating Bruno to the rank of Capo. This shows the first cracks in Diavolo's reign. The court of the Crimson King is not as united and invincible as it initially seemed. So while Giorno endures a bit of a bump by not being able to connect to his team members, he has shown a chance at victory at just how instable Passione really is. Again, a duality is present and in this case it presents Giorno with hope. Hope that is immediately complicated by the appearance of Trish Una, the boss's daughter. This presents a conundrum for Bruno and Giorno. The straightest path to the boss would be to use Trish as a bargaining chip. Yet, because they are both smart and righteous, they decide against it and instead protect her from the hitman team, La Squadra d'Esecuzione, all in hopes that they will still somehow get closer to the boss. This is important in establishing that neither Bruno nor Giorno would forgo a potentially fruitless endeavor if the only alternative is too risky and, well, dumb. But also, they don't take shortcuts. They do their duty fully and don't just try skipping to the results. Now this is where Golden Wind properly starts. We already talked a bit about La Squadra in another video, so instead of talking about them individually, let's talk about their effect in the story to keep it breezy. I know y'all have places to be and bread to earn. Formaggio, as the first member of La Squadra to appear, does two important things. One, he raises the stakes significantly. Zucchero and Sale were tenacious and dangerous of course, but they were only motivated by money and were dealt with relatively easy. Not to mention that they could be defeated without being killed. This stops being an option right here. Every fight after Formaggio is a deathmatch with only one side being able to come out alive. Not only does this heighten the tension, but it also has thematic relevance. The main reason why La Squadra is so dangerous is because of their resolve. While the previous enemies were motivated by money, these assassins are catalyzed not just by monetary reasons, but by revenge, justice and anger. They want to avenge their comrades, and the resolve that gives them makes them far more dangerous. Two, their fate and their strength establishes the terror of Diavolo further. 
The brutal warning they receive after Sorbet and Gelato's attempt to recover Diavolo's identity makes it 100% clear that this is an unyieldingly evil and cruel force that Bruno and Giorno will eventually have to face. After the idea of the organization got so thoroughly cracked by the previous arc, this bit re-establishes Diavolo as truly terrifying. This is enhanced by just how strong the members of La Squadra are. It gives the gang and us a taste of the type of power Diavolo commands under him, even if it is through these defectants. However, while Formaggio introduces these two core functions, La Squadra as a whole actually ends up fulfilling a third. They force our gang to steal their resolve. Every fight is not only a grueling battle of life and death, but also a clash of the combatants' resolve, and every time they clash, the winner wins by hardening and evolving their resolve. Additionally, on more than one occasion, the catalyst for that hardening is not just La Squadra, but also Giorno. Giorno inspires each and every member of his team except Bruno, who is already smitten, and Narancia, which will be important in a bit. He forces Abacchio to begrudgingly accept him as a competent member of the team, and impresses Fugo with his tenacity, all in the Man in the Mirror fight. He also ends up showing Mista the way and reigniting his optimism and resolve and allowing him to believe in reality again during White Album. In short, Jonas Shine makes the team slowly understand how much of a beacon and force he is. This even extends to his enemies. In his only solo fight, his enemy, Babyface, is in awe at Jorno's rapid improvement in quick thinking and adaption, and, inspired by it, grows and evolves himself to properly rival him. It's also in this section where we get to know all of the backstories regarding the Bucci gang. While they all basically deserve their own videos, what is interesting to note for today is that they have all been dealt a bad hand by fate. Some through factors directly outside of their control, some through bad decisions they have made, and some through the cruelty of their fellow man. And through these bad hands, each of them received their own personal hurdles that they eventually either have to overcome, to accept, or be swallowed by. It's part of achieving the resolve they will eventually need, and while some succeed, others don't. As the members of La Squadra start dwindling to a single remaining member, there is hope. Giorno and Bruno have now seen that they can, through combined effort, overcome even those said to be the elite of Passione before their betrayal. They could beat them, and maybe, just maybe, that means they can beat the boss as well. He is closer than ever before, they have earned his trust, they have proven their strength, they are almost at a point where they can challenge him. Right? And then... King Crimson. This is the moment when all hope is lost. Bruno and Giorno, together with the team, overcame any obstacle they were faced with. They worked hard, they were smart, they persisted. But of course, that is not enough to overcome fate itself. Additionally to getting overconfident, Bruno specifically makes one crucial mistake. He forgoes his usual calm and calculated strategies in favor of a passionate, emotional reaction to the boss's real intentions. While his resolve to be just is certainly an important and good quality, this time it bites him in the ass. Instead of considering any alternatives, he rushes in to pursue the boss after he harms Trish. In other words, he skips the last leg of his mission and attempts to gain the results immediately. And of course, fate responds with a brutal, crimson fist right through his abdomen. This single punch destroys everything Giorno and Bruno had been working towards. This is made even more tragic when you consider that up until now, Bruno seemed like a perfect encapsulation of what being a resolute leader means, even more so than Giorno in some aspects. But like Icarus, he saw the sun and got closer than he should have, and in turn, came crashing down much too soon. This scene is also important for Diavolo, as it's the first time he properly interacts with the main cast and the story itself. The scene pushes all the subtle build-up around him into the forefront. Now both the cast and we get to witness what exactly they are up against. The absolute state of society and fate itself. He is the status quo. He is reality. He is the boss. And you cannot overcome him with just fighting hard. There is something the gang is missing, something essential they will only discover 
further down the line. And so, their journey ends here. Or it should have, had it not been for Giorno. While it isn't directly his resolve that brings Bucciarati back, it is gold experience, the embodiment of his soul and being, which returns Bruno from the afterlife. And Bruno himself later states that Giorno was who revived him, not just through gold experience, but through his words of resolve back in Napoli. Instead of the journey ending, the gang is confronted with the most important decision and one of the key scenes of the part. The betrayal at the boat. This scene is a turning point for the characters as it represents the test of their resolve. Will they be able to overcome their weaknesses and anxieties and be able to face life, fate and the boss head on in the name of their ambitions? Or will they be held back and retreat? One answer is just, the other logical. And so, one by one, all the members steel themselves and decide that their trust in Bucciarati and his actions overshadows any fear or weakness. One by one, they board the boat, steps empowered by resolve. One by one, except two members. Fugo is still plagued by his anger issues, but more crucially, he is unable to trust and believe in himself. He hates his stand, Purple Haze, and thus despises his very being. Out of the entire crew, he is the only one who doesn't accept neither himself nor his stand, and consequentially, his resolve and conviction suffers. He is unable to put belief and resolve above logic, and so makes the logical choice not to oppose the boss. He is the weakest link of the team, so it makes sense for him to stay behind. Additionally, this decision is enormous and important, so to probably sell both the danger and the immense dedication of the other members, someone had to be left behind, and it makes sense for it to be Fugo. While Fugo is held back by his inability to accept himself, Narancha is held back by his need to depend on others and his insecurity. Narancha is by far the most immature member of the group, and that is also reflected in how shaky and unhardened his resolve actually is. Even though he bests Formaggio, he doesn't actually do much during the squatter arc besides that. And, more crucially, he never gets an inspiring moment with Giorno. And because the resolve is, much like him, yet underdeveloped and immature, he hesitates getting on the boat for too long and misses his chance to follow Bucciarati. Only after seeing Trish be hurt by the world and betrayed by her kin, similar to him, does he receive the resolve he lacked. The human heart is hardened by the empathy for others' pain. Narancha is, after all, a sweet boy who hides his real nature and acts out in an attempt to be noticed and elicit a response. And so, with his new burst of resolve, Narancha departs with the others and they begin their desperate struggle against fate. Narancha is the first one to get tested by fate. He may have had a rush of determination at the sight of Trish, but he hasn't proven himself yet. And now that they are actively opposing fate together, he has to do it quickly. This is precisely why the first arc after Betrayal focuses on doing exactly that. Clash and Talking Heads is probably my least favorite part of Vento Aureo, but it too has a very clear function. Finally let Narancha show that he is a worthy member of the modern crusaders. And the arc creates the perfect conditions for such a test. During the Formaggio fight, Narancha could basically just brute force it. However, when faced with the best couple, that simply isn't an option. He is put into a situation where he cannot expect help or reassurance from anyone, and more importantly, has to patiently think and push forward meticulously, thus facing his weaknesses. When he finally confronts Tiziano and then refuses to buckle under Squalo's attack, it's more than just a cool moment. It's him demonstrating that the hesitation he showed at the betrayal has been completely washed away by his resolve. All his issues and shortcomings have flown away. A similar treatment is given to the final member of the team, Trish Una. While all the other members have shown their resolve and their determination, Trish has, understandably, been mostly a background character and, in a way, even a sort of MacGuffin, an element that only catalyzes the plot without really being part of it in any substantial way beyond that. However, maybe exactly because of her relative unimportance as a character, her test of worthiness is by far the most crucial. Giorno, the shining light of resolve, flickers as he loses both of his arms in his initial clash with Notorious B.I.G., incapacitating him and, more devastatingly, disabling his stand permanently. Yet, 
they are given one tiny sliver of hope in the form of Journal's Ladybug, and it falls onto Trish to defend it. And in this stressful situation, in this desperate struggle, she finally awakens to who she really is and in doing so, activates her stand, Spice Girl. Diavolo inadvertently saved Giorno, since his daughter and her resolve is the only reason Giorno doesn't become permanently incapacitated during the plane fight. However, it is also his daughter's awakening that leads to Diavolo deciding to take action himself, in a way awakening as well. Risotto Nero is mostly a background character throughout Golden Wind. However, once the gang reaches Sardinia, he takes on a very crucial role. He drags the boss out into the daylight. Both in the anime and the manga, he is the one that brings the bizarre nature of the boss's identity out in the open. Not only that, he nearly kills him as well. This is because La Squadra, as a whole, has demonstrated all the qualities necessary to overcome fate. They were resolute, brave, strong, resilient, and they made many, many sacrifices. Sacrifice is the one ingredient Bucciarati's gang has so far lacked, and because of that, La Squadra comes as close as no one else to their goal. Through Risotto, their spirit and their resolve almost win. But they make two crucial mistakes. One, they are motivated by revenge, a lower, crude motivation lacking the nobility and dignity of those who are truly capable of overcoming fate. And two, on the final stretch, Risotto fails because he becomes overconfident. He, thinking he has already won, boasts about how he will kill the boss, thus betraying the credo of La Squadra. He, similarly to Bucciarati, is in too much of a hurry and in his quickened pursuit of victory ends up neglecting his own method and process. He, a mere jester, dares to sneer at the Crimson King in his own court, his own hometown. And so, the King brutally, suddenly, but rightfully, puts Risotto and all of the Hitman team back in their place, ending their little rebellion. So far, the gang has done the exact thing they did during the first half. They fought, they pushed through, they persevered. But as King Crimson showed them and us, that is simply not enough. Courage, resolve, strength, perseverance, those are all important, but when tasked with opposing fate, the main deterministic force of the Jojo universe, the team so far lacks that one crucial ingredient that will give them a chance. As the brutal battle on Sardinia ends, Bucciarati's gang does the last thing they need to legitimize their claim to victory. They endure a sacrifice of their own. Leone Abacchio is probably, at this point, the most fragile member of the team. While he did have enough resolve to board the boat, his resolve comes entirely from his belief in Bucciarati and subconsciously even a bit in Giorno. And while gaining resolve from someone else isn't a bad thing, having your determination based solely on another person makes resolve kinda half-assed. It doesn't come from you or your heart, and that is exactly Abacchio's problem. All of his belief is external, he sees no value and finds no resolve from himself as a person. Thus, he is the weakest link at the time and the first to go. However, his sacrifice is also what redeems him. In the last few moments of his life, his stand produces the one thing that can help the gang fulfill their mission. And the stand is, as we know, a true reflection of the soul. So, in the last moments, the moments that really matter, Abakio shows his ultimate resolve and so proves to us and to himself that he didn't need to become resolute or reliable at all. He had been what he wanted to be all along. He simply didn't see it. But in his final moments, his very soul instinctively does the right resolute thing. Before his sacrifice, the gang's goal was clear, but their method wasn't. They just knew they had to find a way to defeat the boss, but they had no idea what it exactly was. Only through Moody Blues do they see Diavolo's face, and only because they start looking for that face, they get contacted by Le Monsieur, and only through him do they gain access to the power able to defeat Diavolo. Again, Diavolo does the immediately rewarding thing, killing Abacchio, but because he rushes and skips to this result, he ends up leading the gang to the truth through Abacchio's sacrifice. In a way, the gang always had a result in mind, but only through Abacchio, the final piece, did that result receive a process. 
The afterlife scene is, in my opinion, one of the most thematically important scenes in all of Part 5. Abakyo's partner delivers a monologue that concisely summarizes the logic by which fate operates and how it favors and disfavors the souls under its command. By focusing on a result and only on that result, you begin looking for shortcuts. And those shortcuts might seem that they lead you to that desired result, but in reality, all they do is make you lose sight of the truth. The truth, as in the true, earned and justified result of your actions, can only be reached by performing those actions in a complete and consistent manner. That is what it means to have resolve, and this is what you need if you want to carve out your life and your truth within the many twists and turns of fate. And I love this scene, not just because it encapsulates everything you need to know about Vento Aureo's themes, but also because this scene is incredibly isolated and separate. This scene has basically nothing to do with Diavolo and his story, so to have these ideas be re-emphasized in such an obscure corner of Vento Aureo's story makes these words feel like universal concepts within the world of Golden Wind, as if these are concepts that are always countable and palpable regardless of where or when. This makes later events feel a lot more in line as well. Part 5, and most of Jojo, shows us an image of a deterministic, stone-carved destiny that you can only oppose and change when you follow a very strict and very defined set of rules and guidelines, and it's here where these guidelines are spelled out directly. But because it's done in this afterlife scene of a character that really doesn't matter past this point, it doesn't feel like exposition and flows naturally into the world building. Abakyo's death hits the gang hard. Jorna does his signature tremble, Narancha literally falls apart, and Bruno stoically moves forward, as he always does, and even bleeds one final time despite his condition, a sign that loss and sorrow are inherent and intrinsic parts of being human. Mista, while seemingly composed, has his calm demeanor recontextualized later on. He is clearly holding back. Nonetheless, this represents both a tremendous downfall for the gang, but also a glimmer of hope. Through Abakyo's actions, they receive the bust of the boss, which leads them to Polnareff, their first real fighting chance. However, them receiving that chance also activates their last big challenge before the final confrontation with Diavolo. They already defeated La Squadra, the best of the best. So now it is time to fight the worst of the worst. They faced every part of Diavolo's empire. Power, greed, promiscuity, violence, volatility and much more. But now they have to confront the last aspect of the underground world. Depravity. Meet Chocolata and Secco, a couple so evil, so sadistic, so depraved that even Diavolo, who is named after the literal devil, calls the former the worst piece of shit to ever exist. They represent the final hurdle for the gang and the final test of their resolve before they can finally clash with Diavolo himself. So it is fitting that the ones trying to oppose fate are pitted against those who betrayed their calling. Chocolata became a doctor, swearing to never use his knowledge in the pursuit of harm, only to then do literally that for years on end. Secco, meanwhile, opposed both his death at the hands of Chocolata and the feelings towards him he should have had. Reasonably, Secco should have been terrified and disgusted by Chocolata's actions, but instead became his loyal follower and pet. These two essentially managed to oppose their paths they should have walked in a small way, but they did it through cruelty, depravity and inhuman sadism. They escaped their fate through a twisted, perverted idea of resolving conviction and succeeded thus far. And now, it is time to pit this perverse iteration of resolve against the gang's more righteous, idealistic resolve. The fight immediately sticks out by having several additional magnitudes of collateral damage. While most stand battles are often contained between stand users, Chocolata's Green Day causes one of the biggest single stand massacres in the entire series, with first the marina at the fishing village, and then a large portion of Rome being affected by the flesh-eating mold. It is a monstrous ability and it pushes the stakes up to the highest degree yet. With an enemy like this, the two main players in this fight, Giorno and Bruno, are pushed to their limits. Giorno is, for the first time, faced with an enemy he genuinely hates. 
During all the earlier fights, he didn't really have any personal feelings towards his opponents past his desire to win. In the case of Babyface, he even seemed to have a weird sort of respect for its growth and progress. But after seeing the senseless murder caused by Green Day, we, for the first time in a long while, see him be properly pissed. The only comparable example would be his anger at Black Sabbath killing the janitor, but this time it's on a much larger scale. From the very moment Jorno witnesses the ability, it is clear that it awakens a burning fury inside of him, a loathing anger at the unflinching cruelty and sadism of Chocolata. And so, during their fight, Jorno ends up tapping into his Dio side fully, in one of my favorite moments of the part. Jorno pretends to do the typical shonen hero thing of giving a beaten enemy a chance to stay alive. Very much Jonathan. But once Chocolata exploits that chance to try and attack Jorno and kill Mista, because of course he does, Jorno reveals that he's indeed not purely Jonathan. His nobility had been an act to buy time for the beetle he had planted in Chocolata's head to hatch and eat his brains. He essentially used the trappings of the typical righteous hero as a facade to trick his opponent into security, only to subvert the hero trope and deliver the killing blow. It is clear that, in this moment, Jorno truly channels Dio, but sublimates those negative, cruel tendencies into his battle against an enemy that really, really doesn't deserve anything else. And so, Chocolata receives the longest beatdown in the series, complete with Mudaz and FUCKING NORMIES! <laughs> Meanwhile, Bruno has to give in to something completely different. Ever since his quote, death, we are given glimpses of his loss of humanity, a lack of blood, body temperature and pulse. But it is only after Green Day, the ability that devours life, fails to affect him that we and Giorno are finally given confirmation. His life is already over. He simply moves forward with the life energy Giorno gave him. While we will talk about this in a later section, what's important to note here is that up to this point, Bruno, Giorno and the story itself have all been trying to avoid talking about this, as if to try and pretend it isn't the case. But the absolute wall that Seko and Chocolata are forces all three of them to finally come to terms with the reality of Bucciarati's situation. And indeed, that really seems to be a condition for victory, as their first skirmish with the dastardly duo at Marina di San Nicola ends with our gang having to retreat in panic. Only after Bucciarati has accepted that his fate has run its course is it that they can properly face the duo head on. In his fight with Seco, Bruno goes as far as to utilize his status as a living corpse to his advantage, shattering his own eardrums to win. It is also here that the mysterious help they received is revealed to have come from no other than Jean-Pierre Polnareff himself, ex Stardust Crusader and full-time Silver Chariot. Stardust Crusaders is, of course, the most iconic part of Jojo. However, Polnareff's inclusion, together with Jotaro's presence in parts 4 and 6, thoroughly establishes the events of part 3 as an important story even in-universe. The surviving Crusaders are treated like legends by the story, their appearance and actions shown to be these big, monumental reveals. They are the original ragtag team of stand users. Araki has also always had a particular talent at aging characters believably. And while Jotaro is often cited as the main example of this, I think that he handles Polnareff equally well. In part 3, we are shown this muscle-bound, confident goof with an inner melancholy. However, fast forward a decade and a half, and in Vento Aureo, we meet a broken man slimmed down in a wheelchair, missing half his limbs and blind in one eye. But more important than his physical appearance is his demeanor. Just by the way he carries himself and acts, we can infer a lot about what Polnareff's been up to. Gone is the Joker, the whimsical, comical Casanova. This husk of a man is constantly on edge, ready to be betrayed and ready to fight back. We can tell after just a few minutes that this man has seen some shit. However, this also works in establishing him as an experienced fighter. If this were any other older man, we would be told that he's, quote, experienced, but that would be it, we would just have to take their word for it. But by including a crusader, we don't even have to be told. We know what these guys have been through. Vanilla Ice, Dio's World, these guys have survived some of the most desperate struggles in the series. And Polnareff very quickly demonstrates that his expertise has only grown, between his blood trick and his desire to see Trisha stand to try and approximate what it could be. It is also valuable that we quickly discuss the relevance of the arrows in this part. While some people find their story… dumb, I always thought that they make a brilliant addition to the series lore. 
Since they weren't thought of from the beginning of the series, introducing their origin believably was always going to be difficult, and I think the flashback we get does it pretty well. By making the arrows coated with a life culling virus, you both give it an explanation and make it as weird as we are used to in JoJo. But what's really important is that life culling property. The arrows don't just awake stands, they force the pierced organism to evolve. This can again be seen as another way by which people can grow into something that can oppose their fate. The beetle arrow specifically pushes this concept even further by directly piercing the very soul and granting it another evolutionary step, this time onto a plateau upon which lies the complete reign and power over souls and life. And it is this plateau that is at the center of the final arc of Golden Wind. And so, after Diablo finally reveals himself, it begins. The arrow has been seized, Polnareff has missed his last train home, and it is time for one last crusade. Everything has led us here. We began with a brilliant overture, we fought our way through a violent accelerando. Our hearts stopped at the shocking sforzando and weeped at the sorrowful lacrimosa. Our very blood sang along the crashing crescendo. But now, the final stage is set. The actors are in position. The melody begins to fade and the curtains are about to fall. The spectacle nears its climactic finale. And what better way to end such a composition than with a requiem? The Requiem Plays Quietly is one of the most misunderstood and underappreciated arcs in all of JoJo. It's often seen as a stretch out waste of time before the final fight, which is just wrong. The entire Requiem arc is the actual final fight of the series. It's the thematic culmination of everything that the story has been building towards from the very beginning. It's the final stand against fate itself. Chariot Requiem's birth at the hands of the arrow begins the arc and immediately we are bombarded with symbolism. The word Requiem refers to the Misa Pro Defunctis, the Mass of the Dead, a Mass and celebration offered to the souls of the deceased in the Catholic Church. However, it also refers to THE Requiem in D minor, a specific Requiem Mass composed by classic composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. The latter reference is not only specifically brought up by Araki, but also lends some pretty interesting interpretations. Mozart's Requiem has been the subject of many legends and rumors due to two things. It is still not known who commissioned him to write it, and Mozart died before he could finish it, leaving the Requiem incomplete. This reference is reflected in every aspect of Chariot Requiem. Its design is based on the common depictions of the figure who supposedly commissioned the piece a musketeer with a folded hat, whom some believe was actually Death himself in disguise. The Death theory is specifically interesting because it implies that Death itself gave Mozart the task of composing a song he would never finish, almost as if to laugh in humanity's face and dangle the futility of our existence in front of us. Death is, after all, the ultimate fate of all living things. And this ultimate fate came for Mozart as it is now coming for Giorno and the gang. This connection flows into the idea of the Requiem stands and Chariot Requiem in particular being the ultimate walls of fate, and its name is also a reference. Notice how it's not called Silver Chariot Requiem, but just Chariot Requiem, as opposed to the other Requiem stand we see, which retains its full name. This isn't just Araki being random, but it has a purpose. Chariot Requiem isn't a fully matured Requiem stand because its user, Polnareff, lacks the mental and physical strength to control it and harness its potential. This makes Chariot an incomplete Requiem, just like Mozart's was. However, even when incomplete, Chariot Requiem is quite possibly one of the most monstrously powerful stands in all of Jojo. As a Requiem stand, it has dominion over the human soul, but as a Berserk stand, it lacks the will and purpose of the human mind. As such, Chariot Requiem clings to the last conscious will of his not quite deceased master, to protect the arrow, and for this goal it uses all of its abilities. 
It rips the soul out of every being in its radius out of its body and into a different one, causing confusion and disorientation. Any attack against the arrow is immediately retaliated and countered, and slowly but surely, every organism is mutated, switched and fused with beings from alternate realities, until no creature capable of seizing the arrow is left. It is indiscriminate, it's inevitable and it's nigh on invincible. Chariot Requiem is the final wall of fate in the story, a wall to be overcome not just by Giorno and the gang, but by Diavolo as well. Chariot Requiem represents one part of fate that every person must face if they wish to overcome it, themselves. It's the shadow of one's soul, and attacking it means attacking oneself. They have to quite literally fight their own souls and stands in order to take the final step against fate, a step that will be the final test of resolve and will reward the victor with the means to rule over souls and fate, the Requiem Arrow. As we established before, overcoming fate takes many things, grit, determination, resolve, but also sacrifice. And so, the arc focuses on the sacrifices that have to be made to reach the arrow. Due to the gang's relative lack of information on the boss, they make the mistake of assuming that Diablo is hiding in Bucciarati's body, as they yet don't know about Doppio. They, in a way, attempt to skip to the end of the arc without realizing that they don't actually know enough, and this mistake costs them dearly. Before anyone has time to really react, time is erased and Narancia is dead. This death is especially cruel, because thanks to the body swap shenanigans, it is Narancia's voice and body that announces passing. Again, an ironic cruelty by fate. This time, unlike with Abakio's death, Mista doesn't hold back his tears, as he most likely was doing it for Narancia. Hope seems lost, but nonetheless, they have to push on. Thanks to Polnareff, they finally figure out the dual nature of Diavolo and Topio. They have to move on, they have to catch up to the Requiem. They simply do not have time to mourn. All Giorno can do is think back to how upset Narancia was that Abakio's corpse would be left all alone, far from home, and vows to bring Narancia back to his hometown. As he grows a bush of flowers over him, just as he did with the gangster that catalyzed his dream, one thing becomes clear. Among all the atrocities Diavolo has committed, the murder of a scared child forced into a solitary death is what truly sets Giorno's resolve for this final confrontation. It may seem like Diavolo made the perfect move here and adequately handled the situation to his advantage, and while, yes, he was an instrument of fate to punish the gang's mistake, he himself also made one. He, in his typical fashion, took the most straightforward and easy way to accomplish his strategy. His plan to take on Arancha as he could detect him via Aerosmith is a solid approach, however, Executing it immediately like that, when the gang is completely isolated from any other potential hosts of Diavolo, is a crucial mistake. Had he waited for a bit longer until the group was closer to other people, the gang might have erroneously assumed Diavolo to be inhabiting the body of any random passerby. But by beginning his attack when the gang is alone, he inadvertently gives Giorno a crucial clue to figuring out where he's actually hiding. His skipping to the results bites him in the ass, as this is exactly what ends up happening. After Diavolo is discovered, we get perhaps the most blatant chase of the result yet. He literally ignores the gang attacking him and just books it towards Chariot Requiem. He then realizes and explains the Requiem's only weakness. As it's a shadow of one's soul, it can be crippled or even destroyed if the soul is attacked. This means that, again, overcoming fate and in this case defeating Requiem necessitates sacrifice. Only by abandoning one's hubris and sacrificing the soul can humanity hope to overcome. However, as Diablo demonstrates, this rule isn't so strict. He merely damages his soul orb and cripples Chariot enough to take the arrow from him, again foregoing any proper process and instead skipping to the result. But after all the times he has done this, his comeuppance is at hand. Just as he feared, his past catches up to him in the form of his daughter Trish. She, despite being caught by King Crimson, denies her father the arrow and makes one last stand against him, using the resolve she had built up during her time with the gang. As the arrow changes hands again, Bruno musters his resolve one last time and makes the sacrifice Diavolo couldn't. He wills himself against fate and destroys his own soul to fully annihilate Chariot Requiem. It's interesting to note that it is Bruno of all people who overcomes the Requiem. 
He might have died back in Venezia due to his rush, but now, days after his death, his resolve still burns bright enough to give his gang the final edge. As he soars up to heaven, he finally lays out his journey. Before he had met Giorno, he had been asleep, a slave to his fate, unable to make the first step towards his goals that he knew were right. But thanks to Giorno and the shining resolve within him, Bucciarati awoke and finally moved on forward with what he believed was just. His soul was reborn and he was freed from his shackles. Thanks to Giorno, he was able to face his fate head on and even go further than ordained. And so, his soul made of literal gold, serenaded by angels and cherubs, Bruno Bucciarati ascends to the heavens, everything returns to normal and he leaves the rest to Giorno. Diavolo, arrogant as ever, decides to not run and instead to mock Giorno, as he predicts with Epitaph that the arrow will reject and kill him. However, at this point, we have seen that Epitaph only shows very vague and incomplete visions. Sometimes, like in the Risotto fight, that is to Diavolo's advantage, but other times, like with Bucciarati destroying the Requiem, the things the visions omit end up biting him in the culo. It's almost as if fate only begrudgingly hands him these premonitions and always only gives him half the picture. And that makes sense, since Diavolo skips and ignores any and all actions and effort he would normally have to perform to oppose fate, yet constantly babbles on about how he is chosen by fate. He is a false champion, a pretender who uses the idea of fate to egomaniacally elevate himself. And fate is a cruel mistress, and doesn't take this mockery lightly. And so, after Diavolo pummels Giorno, certain of his victory, gold experience cracks. And finally, something hatches. The shell is shed, and out comes the true hand of fate. One of the most powerful fictional beings in all of manga. It all started with Giorno and his dream, and so it ends with that as well. He is the one and only character to ever fully evolve his stand into a complete Requiem. Not a half-named Berserk stand like Chariot Requiem, but instead a fully controllable, matured stand. Gold Experience Requiem. Giorno successfully topples fate with the help of the arrow and in doing so becomes an instrument of fate itself, ironically. As Araki himself states in Jojo Veller, GR is a matured version and is like a flower finally blooming right down to the head. This is what gold experience was always meant to become. Additionally, its eyes change. Throughout part 5, many stands either have concealed eyes, weird blind bug eyes, or eyes clouded by mania and insanity. But here, Gold Experience sheds its clouded vision and its eyes become wide open, finally privy to all sights of fate. The Requiem awakens. This transformation is not just a conclusion of Giorno's journey, however, but of two others as well. Through GR, Giorno now stands on the apex of creation. His absolute zero ability gives him the power to be invincible and it puts them on the top of the totem pole of stand users. Just like Dio wanted. However, his ability is defensive, it activates in response to an action and never actually attacks by itself. Additionally, Giorno uses this absolute power to bring justice into his environment, which is very Jonathan. Giorno's ascension with the Requiem marks the thematic fulfillment of not just his own ambitions, but also of his two halves, which both contribute to this conclusion. Giorno also becomes the antithesis of Diavolo. For Diavolo, only the results matter, it's the only thing he seeks. And now, his arch enemy is bestowed with the power to erase any and all results forever. What's interesting here is that even though most of the story was dedicated to overcoming fate, here, at the end of it, Jonah becomes the exerting arm of fate itself, delivering to Diavolo the punishment for his many times of skipping and twisting fate. And punishment is exactly what Diavolo gets. First he gets mocked by his daughter, the only figment of his past not crushed by his hands. And then he, the man who sought eternal life and everlasting reign over others, is now condemned to an eternity of dying without ever arriving at his death. He will never reach truth, 
he will never reach reality. And so, the universe loops him again and again, dying one painful death after another, fulfilling his dream of immortality in the cruelest way possible. And moreover, he is condemned to a fate where, because of the metaphysicality of this loop, he will never ever have an effect on the real world again. Unlike the brave crusaders that fought against him, this devil will never be able to change or influence anything ever again. He will forever be denied the ability to twist and change his or anyone else's fate. There is a literary work by Percy Bysshe Shelley that comes to mind here. You might already know about the poem Ozymandias, but if not, it's about a wanderer being told by an old man that in the desert lie the remains of an old kingdom. Among those remains there is an old pedestal with an inscription. That section of the poem says as follows. <clears throat> and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. It's pretty noteworthy that the phrase King of Kings appears here, just as it does in Golden Wind. Ozymandias tells of an arrogant, megalomaniacal king who believes himself to be the eternal ruler of everything, who then, a few millennia later, is only an obscure, meaningless reference in an empty desert. The poem is about the fluctuating fragility of power and how nothing and no one is eternal. Which is a pretty good analogy for Diavolo and his fate. He thought of himself as the king of kings, the eternal sovereign over all of creation. And yet for all of his ambition, for all of his efforts and actions, he simply could not escape his fate the fate to be forever condemned to obscurity and non-relevance in a weird, eternal death loop. After GR has done its job, the series now flashes back to the events immediately before the story even began in one of the most important and, again, misunderstood arcs of Jojo, Sleeping Slaves. This arc is unique in that it's an epilogue that completely recontextualizes the entire story. Up to now, we have been talking a lot about how both Diavolo and the gang have been trying to overcome and oppose fate. It's been arguably the most prominent theme of the entire part. And now, Sleeping Slaves confirms to us that overcoming fate completely was never possible in the first place. In Sleeping Slaves, we see Bucciarati's gang encounter Rolling Stones, a stand not controlled by its user, but rather fate itself. This bowling ball of doom will sense when a person is fated to die soon and begin targeting them. It will essentially become a teleporting stalker until it manages to touch that person, granting them a painless, immediate death. This ability is mercy, a kind salvation from the inevitable fate ordained for you. And inevitable it is. As the stone begins targeting Bucciarati, Mista fights it and manages to break and seemingly defeat it. He seemingly prevents Bruno's fate. However, fate is unchangeable and any transgression against it will be punished. Mista's fight against Rolling Stones causes the fate of death to spread to two other members of the gang, Narancia and Abacchio. And so, these three characters were doomed to die before our story even began. But wait, how can this be? For this entire video we have been talking about how the themes of the story revolve around the resolve to overcome and oppose fate, but now that's impossible? Was this entire video as pointless as this entire story? No. Not at all, because thanks to Sleeping Slaves, we finally understand how fate works. As we have covered extensively, fate favors those who go through the complete process, who stick by their actions and who show consistent effort, resolve and sacrifice in their pursuit to overcome their destiny. And now, we learn that completely overcoming fate is simply not possible, but that's the whole point. Only the most steeled and refined resolve would ever be able to face and oppose their fate head-on, even with it being ultimately unchangeable. 
it was never about defeating fate. It was about being able to live and fight and move forward, accepting your fate in the hope that your resolve and sacrifice will make even the tiniest positive change in the future. Bruno was always destined to die, as were Narancia and Abacchio after Rolling Stones was stopped. But they, alongside the entire main cast, minus Fugo, face the challenge head on. They all move forward and don't let themselves be held back by fate. No matter how many hardships life threw at them, no matter how much suffering they were ordained to endure, they moved onwards to their goal. Their actions were born of truth, of a resolute desire to bring change and a better world, and thus their actions are allowed to translate into reality. You may not be able to completely twist or change fate immediately, but by way of continuous effort, it can be influenced and directed into a better faded future. As Scolippi says upon seeing Mista's will during the arc, one can hope that this will and resolve will eventually fill their path with meaning and significance, despite the faded suffering. Compare this to Diavolo. While the gang faces their fate head on, understanding the possibility and even the inevitability of death and suffering, Diavolo runs from it. He, as opposed to our modern crusaders, is completely defined by his fear of fate because he lets it. He sees himself as a champion of fate, a king of kings who can never lose. He denies that him being defeated is even possible, going as far as to think he's dreaming or hallucinating when things don't go his way. Diavolo is completely obsessed with fate and lets his obsession not only corrupt him, but also control who he is. He ran from reality for his entire life and deluded himself into believing that he was chosen by fate. And so, he receives the ultimate punishment. For the liar, the thief, the betrayer of his own resolve and will, for the coward who ran from reality, fate and requiem bestowed a never-ending death, an ironic immortality that denies him the ability to ever face reality. He begins the story as the status quo, the unknowable entity that holds his environment in an iron grip of unchanging dominance. And now, he will remain both unchanged and unable to change anything. He was given a world where he could never face reality, not even the reality of death. He's immortal now, but he'll never have any impact on the world, unlike Abacchio, Bruno and Arancia. A cruel but fitting punishment for the man who ran from destiny. Additionally, his constant skipping to results is an impatient, childish way to interact with fate. He was too arrogant, too cowardly and too selfish to go through the actions and sacrifice necessary to create future change. He wanted immediate easy results and for that he was punished. Giorno, meanwhile, has faced every challenge head first. He, alongside his gang, never wavered and never ran from what fate had in store for him instead using his resolve to push himself forward despite the pain they all knew was likely waiting for them. And it was Giorno's shining light that led them. He guided them, not through leadership per se, but by his unwavering will to fulfill his dream, his resolve influencing each member so that they themselves can go on to influence reality. So it's only fitting that Giorno's unflinching will eventually led him closer to the truth than anyone else, allowing him to become the arbiter of fate. His resolve forged a path to lasting, positive change in his environment, and for that, fate gifted him with the eminence of punishing Diavolo for good. We humans are tiny. Our lives last short, and while we delude ourselves into positions of dominance and power, our actual individual influence over our environment and world are rather modest. Like most organisms, we live out our existence in relative irrelevance as the cosmos around us changes and operates in ways we cannot and will not understand or ever be able to partake in. It can sometimes indeed feel like we are sleeping slaves, chained to a destiny we simply cannot foresee or change, a fate out of our control. But we humans are also unique in that our consciousness bestows us with a free will unlike most other beings. Our souls can be steeled and filled with resolve, and it is this resolve that we can use to face our destinies. Our individual actions might not mean much alone, 
but through consistent collective resolve and sacrifice, they can cause ripples in fate, multiplying and strengthening each other until they eventually cause enough cumulative change to create a better future. It is humanity's privilege and providence that our heart and soul can interact with fate in this way. And this is what Golden Wind is about. At the heart of all of Jojo lay the themes of fate and humanity, and every part says something different about these two ideas and their relationship. And Vinto Aureo is about how humanity can live out its will and ambition even in a world of predetermined fate. It's a story about humans looking fate in the eye, accepting what it might hold for them, and yet moving forward with their ambitions despite that. It's the tale of Giorno and Bruno, two young men, waking up from their slumber and breaking the chains that bind them in a noble effort to better the lives of those around them. It's the tale of Diavolo, a demented, inhuman monster that both fancies himself fate's chosen one, yet runs from and denies it at any opportunity. It's a story about humanity's will and how even though our actions might be preordained, they are not meaningless. We don't have to be sleeping slaves to our fates. The will, resolve and truth our actions can be born from can, even in this vast, cruel universe, make a difference, ever so slight. Even when things look completely out of our control, as if an invisible hand is guiding us, we humans can find a way to pursue happiness, righteousness and truth out of our own accord and free will. Our existence isn't hopeless, it isn't chained to our destiny because we have the means to rise up and steal ourselves. As long as we can face the world head on, make no excuses and don't run from it, we can imprint on reality and leave a meaningful mark on the world that maybe, just maybe, lasts longer than we do. And this is why I think Golden Wind is perfect. It chooses an idea and infuses every part of its world, its characters and its story with that idea. It carries its themes into every nook and cranny of its narrative and uses this to create a consistent and insightful message on humanity's inherent struggle with the idea of fate. It, like every story, has its shortcomings, but when compared to the achievements of its storytelling, I am more than willing to overlook them. To me, Golden Wind represents both a lamentation of humanity's shackles and yet a celebration of the glorious human spirit capable of breaking those exact chains. We can all wake up and seize our lives as long as we face it head on and I think that this message, along with everything else, is communicated and executed masterfully. It's hope, it's resilience, it's tragedy, it's resolve, it's fate, it's life. This is why I love part 5 so much. This is why I think that this story is perfect. This is the brilliance of Golden Wind.